Hello, my name is Hannah and I'm a teacher from Twinkle. Thanks for joining me for daily reading. In these five videos, we're going to be reading a story called Sabrina and the River Spirit. Here it is. Every day we'll read a chapter and then we'll talk about a reading skill. Today's reading skill is discussing words and phrases which capture the reader's interest or imagination. So this is the cover of the story. What I'd like you to do first is just take a minute, you'll pause the video, and discuss with someone or have a think to yourself about what this cover tells you. What kind of book do you think this is going to be? Who's this on the front cover? Pause the video now and have a think. Ready? Let's have a look inside. One. The day began as usual. The little ones scampered about while Pa complained of the aches in his back and the tingles in his toes. Sabrina heated bread and pottage over the fire in their old iron pot. The family didn't have the money for a new alchemical stove like other families in the village, but Sabrina didn't mind. She liked the smell of a real fire better. It smelt honest. Before the family ate breakfast, they stood before the shrine. Three clay figures were nestled in the nook above the fireplace. Their paint was flaky and their limbs cracked, but since Pa had injured his back and lost his job on Strong Arms Farm, there was no money for repairs. Sabrina nudged the little ones to remind them to bow their heads as Pa cleared his throat. Thank you, Baal, for the grain and the beans. Thank you, Sana, for light to bless the leaves. Thank you, dear, for water to bless the roots. Sabrina broke off breadcrumbs to give to each of the figurines. Stout Baal, tall Sana, and dainty deer with her long flowing hair. We are only a poor family, a lowly family, Pa went on. We try our best, but we are always cold and hungry, and our bellies always rumble. Please bless us, spirits. Send us barrels of grain, baskets of fruit, and lots and lots of fish. Recently, Pa's pleas had become more and more desperate, and Sabrina had become more and more certain that the spirits weren't listening. After breakfast, Sabrina tied on her apron and filled her pocket with salt for a day's look. Time for school, she said, leading the little ones outside. Have a good day, said Pa, and don't run off with a passing merchant. I won't, Sabrina promised. Sabrina had never travelled further than the next village, but she knew that the merchants came from towns and cities far away. They brought tales of temples and domes, mighty machines and magic shows. Sabrina would love to see all they described, but she knew that it was impossible. Her family depended on her. The village school only cost a penny each for the morning and taught sums and letters. Alongside this, the children were taught about alchemy. Lessons involved mixing simple formulas and drawing diagrams of alchemical contraptions. It was only the basics, but it was a start. Sabrina hoped that her brothers and sisters would achieve great things one day. It was a long walk from their cottage, high on the hillside, to the schoolhouse in the valley below. As usual, they were the last to arrive, and Sabrina, who was already fourteen, hurried her siblings through the gate as the bell rang. Work hard and don't upset the teacher, she called before heading into the village to collect the day's laundry work. The village bustled. Farmhands jostled and gossiped as they headed to the fields. Apparently the river was low, but the farmhands said that there was no need to worry, because Mr Strongarm had bought a new alchemical fertiliser, and it made the grain pop up like a rabbit from a hole. The farmhands might not have been worried about the low river, but Sabrina was. She could hardly make a living as a laundress without water. In the village square, the blacksmith's iron hissed as he plunged hot metal into a liquid that turned the outside bright gold. A cart bounced down the street, delivering wool to the dyers. In the alley stood great vats of dye in every colour the alchemists could dream up. I'm going to stop reading there for a moment, because I'd like us to have a look at this paragraph. The paragraph that I've just read is near the bottom of page two, and it begins, In the Village Square. 
Have you found it? In this paragraph, there is an example of something called onomatopoeia. Can you find it? Pause the video here and write down the word that you think I've spotted that is an example of onomatopoeia. Not sure? I'll give you a clue. Onomatopoeia is a word which, when you read it out loud, makes the sound that it's describing. The word I'm looking for describes the noise that the blacksmith's iron makes as he plunges the hot metal into the cold liquid. It's here on line one. The blacksmith's iron hiss. Try saying that word hissed and make it sound like the iron. Hissed. Why do you think the author has used onomatopoeia? How do you think it helps the reader? Pause the video here and write down what you think. Onomatopoeia makes a sound in the reader's head, or as you're listening to the story being read aloud, you heard the sound hissed. Making the sound out loud makes it easier for the reader to imagine that they are there listening to this happening. It brings the story to life. This paragraph has a lot of words in it that help to bring the story to life and capture the reader's imagination. Can you find a word in the same paragraph which tells me how the wool cart is moving down the street? Pause the video now and find a word that describes the way that the cart is moving. Found it? It's here at the end of the second line. A cart bounced down the street, delivering wool to the dyers. Why do you think the writer has used the word bounced? What if they had just said the cart moved down the street or the cart rolled down the street? What do you think the word bounced tells you about the ground underneath the wheels? Pause the video again and write down or have a think about what the ground under the wheels might be like. Ready? I think that the ground underneath the wheels is bumpy. The word bounced tells me that those wheels are not rolling smoothly down a tarmac pavement. It tells me that they are flying over big chunky rocks or maybe even steps. By using the word bounced, the author tells us much more than just about the wheels of the cart. Now we know a little bit more about the ground under the wheels and about the street that we're walking down. Let's flick back to that illustration on the previous page and find out if we were right about those cobbled stones. Yeah, there they are. No smooth pavements here, lots of steps, lots of bumpy ground. Let's keep reading. More and more people were moving to the village. Some came to work on the farms, which grew bigger each year, while others came to profit from passing merchant trade as ever more alchemical wares were transported up and down the land by boat. Sabrina bowed her head to disguise her gaze as the merchant's daughters bustled past in their jewel-bright gowns, showing off the latest fashions. Sabrina wished that she could afford a colourful gown too, but all she had to wear was a beige smock. Every new alchemist invention seemed like magic. Sabrina just wished that she had a little more magic in her own life. She knocked on the door of the low, thatched building that belonged to the Strong Arms. Mr. and Mrs. Strong Arm ran the biggest farm in the village. Oh, Sabrina, there you are, said Mrs. Strong Arm in the doorway. Her necklace hung with expensive wards against hardship and hunger. How is your pa? Is his leg still troubling him? It's his back, really, said Sabrina, holding out her arms for Mrs. Strong Arm's basket of laundry. It troubles him worse each winter. Even from the doorway, Sabrina could see that the strong arms shrine was five times as elaborate as the one that Sabrina's family had at home. There had to be at least 20 statuettes of every colour and shape, some human, some animal, some dressed in jewels or fur or flames. Oh, the poor man. He always worked so hard and he's had such bad luck. Still, good thing he's got you to help look after the family. Here you go. Mrs. Strongarm deposited a large pile of dyed cloth into Sabrina's basket. 
As Sabrina thanked her and turned to leave, Mrs. Strongarm caught her elbow. One moment, Sabrina. Don't use that old soap. You'll spoil the colours. Here. She held out a bar of alchemical soap, indigo-coloured and dotted with glittering green and black specks. Thank you, gasped Sabrina, as Mrs. Strongarm plonked the soap on top of the laundry. Sabrina couldn't stop staring. It looked more like a precious stone than something you used to wash clothes. I've never used alchemical soap before. I can't wait to try it. And if your pa ever needs anything, said Mrs. Strongarm, waving Sabrina goodbye. As Sabrina set off down towards the river with the Strongarm's washing, she passed villagers climbing the hill with buckets of water. There were no wells in the village, so they depended on the river for every drop of water used for drinking, cooking or cleaning. The village sat at the bottom of the valley, with the river running around it. Upstream, mountains rose from the morning mist. Downstream, the Strong Arms farm occupied the undulating slopes beyond the village. When she reached the meandering river, Sabrina saw that what the farm workers had said was true. The water was lower than she'd ever seen it. She had to climb right down the slippery bank, and the riverbed was covered by only a few inches of water, weeds exposed and drying in the spring sunshine. Sabrina loved to watch the birds and creatures that lived in the river, but today there was no sign of any. Perhaps the river was too low. Cheep, cheep! Cheep, cheep, cheep! Sabrina jumped. Upstream, a little beakling was trapped in the weeds clumped in the low water. Beaklings were colourfully feathered creatures with webbed flippers. This one was so young it didn't even have its iridescent head plumes yet. From further downstream came the soft honking sounds of the adult beaklings looking for their chick. Sabrina kicked off her sandals and plunged into the ankle-deep river. The cool water swirled gently around her feet and splashed against her shins as she waded across. Don't worry, little one, she said. She untangled the panicking chick from the weeds, clutching its downy body between her palms. Here, she said, as an adult raced upstream towards her. The beakling leapt from Sabrina's hand and dropped into the water. Moments later, the two beaklings paddled away, tail plumes wiggling happily. Sabrina laid out her washboard and paddle, knelt beside the river, and dipped a golden gown into the water. As she scrubbed, purple and green bubbles grew as big as her head. Her new alchemical soap was much better than the lye soap she normally used. Stains disappeared almost instantly, and the colours came out brighter than they went in. She beat the gown against her board, then pinned it down on the riverbed with heavy stones. Sabrina watched as the multicoloured soap bubbles drifted gently away on the trickling water. She strained her ears for the splashes of the fish in the river and the chirrups of birds, but, if there were any to be heard, they were drowned out by the calls of the labourers in the fields. As she gazed at the cloudless sky, the spring buds in the trees and the blue mountains in the distance, her thoughts began to drift. Her mind wandered up the mountain, where the river spilled from a spring at its source and began its journey. She knew that she must keep climbing higher. It was important. Loose stones slid beneath her sandals, and clouds swirled around the peak. Near the path trickled the clear stream. Soon she reached a jagged crack in the side of a mountain, less than a handspan wide. Impossibly, a woman was walking out of the fissure towards Sabrina. Her skin was blue and her hair bubbled like river rapids. Her eyes glimmered like wet stones, and her gown was striped silver and grey, the colours of mackerel scales. She was beautiful. But Sabrina could tell, by the limp way in which she held herself, and by the thinness of her cheeks, that something was wrong. I'm going to pause again here, and I haven't turned over, because I want to talk to you about something. In this paragraph, we've got a brand new character. And it's important for the author to help describe the character in as many interesting ways as possible. Take a look at the first line of this last paragraph. Her skin was blue and her hair bubbled like river rapids. Can you tell me what type of imagery is being used here? There's a special word for it. Her hair bubbled like river rapids. Pause the video and write it down if you know it. I'll give you a clue. The word I'm looking for begins with the letter S. Ready? Her hair bubbled like river rapids.
is an example of a simile. Have you heard of a simile? A simile is a phrase where an author compares two things that are similar. It's quite difficult for a reader to imagine hair bubbling. It's quite unusual. But we can imagine a river bubbling. We can imagine the water crashing over the rocks. So the author tells us that the hair bubbled like a river would, and it gives us that extra bit of information to help us imagine the hair. A simile uses the word like. Her hair bubbled like river rapids. There's another simile in this paragraph. Can you find it? Pause the video and write it down if you can. The simile in the next sentence is Her eyes glimmered like wet stones. Here it is. Her eyes glimmered like wet stones. Her eyes are glimmering and the author wants us to imagine that they are shiny and wet and dark like a stone on a pebble beach where the waves have just crashed over. All of the descriptions of this woman are very watery, aren't they? Let's find out who she is and keep reading. She was beautiful, but Sabrina could tell by the limp way in which she held herself and by the thinness of her cheeks that something was wrong. I am dear, said the figure. The river spirit. She was much more imposing in real life than the little chipped figure that stood on the family shrine. Sabrina dropped to her knees and bowed her head. I didn't ask you here to bow to me, snapped the spirit. I need your help. I am being poisoned. Even as she said it, Dia seemed to grow paler and more flimsy. The humans who live along the river bank are growing too many and are taking too much. They fill me with vile alchemicals. Sabrina looked guiltily at the green and purple soap bubbles still clinging to her fingers. My fish are dwindling, Dia continued. My birds are seeking new rivers. My waters have grown so sluggish, I can hardly make it to the sea. Sabrina found her voice. But how can I help? I need a messenger, said Dia. You must travel the length of the river and tell them this, that they are making it sick and that they must stop or else their river will be nothing more than a stinking trail of sludge. That if they continue to treat the river this way, I will be very, very angry, and they will be very, very sorry. Sabrina tried to imagine life without the river. There would be no water to drink, or to wash clothes. The crop would fail, and the village would surely starve. Why me? So many people come to the river, but you are different. You care for the river creatures, and you don't fill my water with poisons. Sabrina furtively wiped her soapy hands on her apron. You're devoted to your family, though you long for adventures, Dia continued. You choose to do the right thing, even when it's hard. You alone heard my call. Please, she begged. You're my only hope. Sabrina nodded, and, as she did so, the mountain top lurched away, and she found herself waking on the grass beside the river bank. The sun was low in the sky already. She rescued the gowns from the river and wrung them dry, all the while thinking about what she had seen. Had her vision been real? Suddenly, a little silver fish jumped from the river and said, Hurry! Sabrina blinked. Where the fish had splashed back into the river, a glinting shape danced beneath the water. She waded in, reached down, and pulled out a handful of silver coins. It was more money than her family had ever possessed at once. Heart pounding, Sabrina fetched a little salt from her pocket and threw it over her shoulder for luck. That's the end of chapter one. There are more questions and activities that you can do after watching the video. Just click the link in the description to see what they are. Join me next time for chapter two, where we'll be learning how to find the meaning of new words using something called context. See you then.